Hello and welcome to another lecture on deep learning. In the last lectures, we have looked at models that are suited for sequences. And we have looked at language modeling as an example application for sequence modeling. If you remember, in sequence modeling, we always want to approximate the probability of the next element of a sequence given the previous ones. And we've looked at various ways to model this. In this lecture, we will look at recurrent neural networks as the deep learning way to model this conditional distribution. In sequence models, we're always interested in finding a good way to model the conditional probability of the next word conditioned on the previous sequence. So the words x1 through xt, if we're modeling the probability of xt plus 1 conditioned on the rest. Now the problem is that if we increase t, so the length of the sequence, this conditioning part grows. Ngram models use the Markov property to truncate the sequence. So they model this conditional distribution only based on the previous n minus 1 words. This way, the number of parameters of this model doesn't increase with the length of the sequence. A problem is that if we want to look at dependencies of the word xt plus 1 on words that are earlier in our sequence, then we would need to increase this n. And if we look at the number of parameters that this model has, these parameters are the counts for the individual words. So this conditional probability table has exponentially many parameters in our vocabulary size. In language modeling, these vocabularies can be very large and this exponential growth in the number of parameters is very quickly prohibitive, which doesn't allow us to use a large n in this model. An alternative way to model this is using latent variables. So they are again an approximation for this conditional distribution. However, instead of explicitly conditioning on the last so many words, they introduce a latent variable h that summarizes the past. So this conditional distribution of x t plus 1 conditioned on the previous sequence is approximated by the conditional distribution of x t plus 1 conditioned on x t, the current word, and the hidden state of the last word. Together, x t and h t can be summarized as the hidden state of the next word, where the hidden state of the next word are a function of xt and ht. So the next hidden state summarizes the last word and the last hidden state. Using a sufficiently powerful function, this actually doesn't have to be an approximation. So think about actually using in f all the previous words. So you could just store all the previous word in the hidden states. In that moment, you would have written down the exact conditional probability table. The idea of recurrent neural networks is actually to use a neural network for this function f. And neural networks are very powerful function approximators. To start this model development, let's look at how we would use a multilayer perceptron to model sequences. So let xt be a mini batch of size n, where each element in the mini batch has d features. In a multilayer perceptron with a single hidden layer, this hidden layer would be modeled by a nonlinearity phi applied to the linear function in x, so x t multiplied 
by the weight that connects the input layer to the hidden layer WXH plus a bias term where we here represent the bias by a vector even though H is a matrix we are using here broadcasting to broadcast this vector to all the elements in the sum with xt w. So this is a slight abuse of notation. Given this hidden layer, we can compute the output layer using again a linear function in the hidden layer plus such a bias vector where again we use broadcasting. Of course, in case of language modeling, where we actually want to predict the probability of words, we, we basically have a classification problem. So we would use a softmax of this output to predict the word probabilities. But in principle, we can use this to predict any classification problem for sequence. So you could imagine classifying each element of a sequence where you have an input to an output using this model. Of course, this doesn't use really the fact that we do have a sequence here. So we're only using xt as the input, so a mini batch for step t, and we're producing an output O, where in language modeling, this output could, for example, be xt plus one, and xt could be the previous word. In our next step, in the model development, we will introduce hidden states into this multilayer perceptron. And these hidden states will be recurrent, the results of which is a recurrent neural network. So again, we have XTs as the mini batch inputs for step T as before. And we're computing not a hidden layer, but a hidden variable using a hidden layer. So this is in recurrent neural networks also called a hidden state. In contrast to before, now the hidden state also has an index t. So each time step of our sequence gets a different hidden variable. A hidden variable is a variable that is not observed to us, or it's an unknown, so to say. And this is modeled using a recurrent neural network. If we have a hidden variable at time step t, we of course also have a hidden variable at the previous time step, t minus one. And this is then used in order to compute the next hidden variable. So again, the hidden variable is computed similar to the hidden layer in the fully connected neural network using a nonlinearity and a linear function in the inputs plus a bias. However, in contrast to before, we're also using the previous hidden state times a weight matrix. Now, because the hidden state of the previous time step has exactly the same dimensions as the hidden state at the next time step, this weight matrix here is a squared matrix. So it's an h by h squared matrix, which relates the previous time step to the current time step. And this is exactly why this recurrent network is called recurrent, because ht is then again used to compute the hidden state of t plus one. The output layer is then given by the linear function in the hidden state at time step t plus a bias. And again, we can use a softmax to compute the output probabilities. And of course, we always have an index for t. So the place where we don't have this index is with all the model weights. The weights for computing the hidden state, as well as the weights to compute the output layer, are the same 
for all time steps. So they are shared between the different time steps. This drastically reduces the number of weights that we do have in our sequence model because we don't have different weights for different time steps. This is similar to the idea of reducing the number of parameters in convolutional neural networks where we are sliding the convolution filters which are our model weights across the whole image. Here we are using the same weights to connect the previous hidden state to the next hidden state and the inputs at this time step to the outputs and so on. Let's look at the schematic of the neural network and how the data flows through the network. We see that we have our output layer, our hidden state and our input. And we have the different time steps xt minus 1, xt, xt plus 1 ht minus 1, the hidden state at time step t minus 1, ht and ht plus 1. And in the end we compute our different outputs. We have our nonlinearities here and we have these different operations. Two converging arrows means that the two elements that go into this convergent operation are being concatenated. Two diverging arrows here means that whatever goes in here is copied to both ends of the arrow. So here we have the matrix xt which is the input for our mini batch at time step t. This is being concatenated with the hidden state at the previous time step t minus 1. Why can we concatenate them? Because we have for a mini batch of size n, both n hidden states for this mini batch, as well as n inputs for the same mini batch. So they do match in the number of rows. So we can take xt and concatenate it to ht minus 1 and get a matrix that has still n rows, just d plus h columns. And this matrix we can then multiply by a weight matrix, which again is a concatenation of the weight matrix that goes from x to h, from the inputs to hiddens, and a weight matrix that goes from the hiddens to the next hiddens. And if we compute this, we get exactly the same thing out as if we just had computed xt times w xh plus ht minus 1 times wh h. This is the same as that. So that is why we can view these converging arrows as a concatenation operation. We would add a bias to that, where the bias in this case is a single vector. And the result of that sum is then fed into our nonlinearities to compute the hidden state. And this hidden state then is copied over to the next time step but also used in order to compute our output layer. How can we apply this to a language model? In order to compute a language model, we are using the recurrent neural network in order to approximate this conditional distribution of the next element of a sequence conditioned on the previous elements by this recurrent neural networks, which uses the hidden state of the previous element in order to model the hidden state of the next element. So this hidden state is a summary of all the previous elements. And we use again this 
function f, namely the recurrent neural network there. Now, in a language model, basically the part that we are conditioning on can be seen as the input and the label that we're modeling, that we're predicting is again the sequence, but it's the next element in the sequence. So if you look at this example here, the phrase, the time machine by H, G and so on, Wells, then we always use the previous word as the input and the next word as the output at a given time point. And we model this using the recurrent neural network. So at time step one, the would be the input in order to compute the hidden state in order com to compute the output and with a softmax on the output the probability of the word time. In the next step we would use time as the input to condition on the previous hidden state, compute the next hidden state in order to compute the output which is the probability of the next word in the sequence which is machine and so on and so forth. So we would again use this word as an input to compute the output and then we use this as an input and so on. Now in this example we used words as features. Words are just um, categorical features and we discussed that we use typically one-hot encoding to model these categorical features. Where in the one-hot encoding of words that belong to a vocabulary of size n means that these one-hot encoded vectors will be vectors that are all zeros of length n with a single index value that is a one. So it's a single one in this vector of zeros. So for each token in our sequence, we create a vector EI that is initialized as a vector of zeros and then set the ith element of this vector to one. Let's look at an example. The sequence, the monkey in the bar is a sequence of one, two, three, four, five different words that belong to a much larger vocabulary. So our vocabulary also may contain words that are not in the sequence. So n is larger than this five. And each word corresponds to one of these vectors that is all zeros but has a one at the position of the corresponding index of this word. So let's say that the word the in the sequence here, which appears twice, is encoded as the vector 0, 0, 1, and so on until you have n entries, all zeros. And this gives us a single row in our matrix xt. Now if we have these vectors, actually something interesting is happening because we're now using this vector to multiply it by a weight matrix. So if x is the input, then in order to compute the hidden state, we're multiplying this input by a weight matrix. This weight matrix that we're multiplying x with now actually has one row for each word in our vocabulary. So it, the number of rows in this weight matrix also equals our vocabulary size. And if we are multiplying this one-hot encoded row vector with the matrix W, this means that we are pulling out the corresponding row from this matrix W. So it's the row that corresponds to the word the. And 
we actually only use this particular row if we are using the word the as input. We are not using it for any other word in our sequence. So we are only using this row here and we are using it here. And this means that this row in W is only there as a weight when used in combination with the word the. For this reason we can actually interpret this row as an embedding of the word. The embedding is a continuous vector. So it's a vector of values in R. And the encoding is a binary vector. So we have a separation of the encoding of the words and the embedding of the words. And the encoding are in our feature vector. So it tells us, the encoding tells us which word is at the corresponding position in the sequence. And the embedding is a, a continuous vector representation of this particular word. Now let's summarize the recurrent neural network. It is called recurrent because it uses recurrent computation of the hidden states. And the hidden states, they summarize all the historical information of the sequence up to the current time step. Because we always use the same weights to connect all the different time steps, the number of parameters in the recurrent neural network does not grow if we increase our sequence length. We can use recurrent neural networks in order to build language models and the trick was that the output at of the sequence equals to the input of the next element of the sequence. So we use the current word as the input in order to predict the probability of the next word, which means that the next word will then be the input at the next time point and the next to next word will be the output of the next time point and so on. And in order to map our sequence of words in order to a vector representation, we use a one-hot encoding and we use this encoding to map it to the corresponding row in the weight matrix uh, matrices, which can be interpreted of a continuous vector embedding of the corresponding word. And with this, I want to say thank you for listening and I see you next time. Bye bye.